Fast and Furious is a decent game, but it feels mediocre. In the game we get three types of races, destination races, top speed races and drift. The drift controls are great, because the game seems to be centered around these controls. In top speed races, once you bought the fastest car and installed nitros on it, races are just a waiting game. Nitros gets you to top speed almost instantly. And since there aren't obstacles on your way, you just hit the gas until you're done. But until you get to buy the expensive cars, the car doesn't handle that well. All cars seem to be rear wheeled and turning them doesn't feel that good. The game also has free roam. But don't get excited. It's of the bad sort. In the game you can drive on highways and there are exit points on the highway. That's it. That's the free roam. Driving in a straight line on a highway. Alone. Because there are no NPC cars. You are alone on the highway. Doesn't sound exciting, right? That's because it isn't. There are several car dealerships and tune shops on the map, but it's so boring to drive along the highway and that's why most of the game I use the fast travel option. Gladly the game has that option, rather than driving to 8 different car dealerships on an empty highway. As for cars, because the game takes place in Japan, most cars are Japanese. But don't worry. There are also plenty of American cars too. Know why? Because the game has a whopping amount of around 100 cars. Which you can also customize from a wealth of options. You can equip your car with body kits, rims, spoilers, finals of many different sort. You have plenty of options there. Visually, I like how the game looks similar to Need for Speed Underground 2. But even if in some moments it reminded me of the game, Fast and Furious is not even close, not even close to the best racing games on the PSP. The difficulty curve is also annoying. At first you drive such a sluggish car that you wonder why the game is called Fast and Furious. And the more you progress, the more noticeable the difficulty curve gets. Some races are easy, while in others you have no chance against the competition. But luckily you can race the same easy opponents again and again to win cash. And the game kinda forces you to grind the same easy opponents, especially since top speed races are based solely on car stats. There's no skill involved there, you just need to have the fastest car. Also even if you have 40 different race events, you will feel like you race on the same handful of tracks over and over. This game, with the right budget, could have turned out into a worthy competitor for Midnight Club. But instead, even if it tries to make an effort to not get to that level, it still reaches the tie-in level performance. And you know how movie tie-in games are. Ok, I'm a little bit exaggerating because the game isn't really that bad. But compared to the best racing games on the PSP, it is bad. And it's just too bad, because you can feel the potential of the game. You can feel that someone tried. But it gets overshadowed by the rather mediocre end result of the game. It has so many things that it does good, like the number of cars, the customization menu and even the graphics to some extent. But the poor controls, empty world, disappointing free roam and repetitive tracks make the game lose a lot. Ghostbusters the video game is an impressive game. But it depends on you if you consider it like this or not. The pros exceed the cons. Problem is the con are the controls. The game being almost a direct port of the PS2 version uses the same game mechanics. Problem is the PS2 has two joysticks. What to do said the developers. Let's make people aim with the face buttons. And truth is I've played other games like this and it was ok. I've played Call of Duty like this and I liked the game. I played this game like this and I liked it. But I admit that not everyone gets used to these controls. At least the targeting system is forgiving. You don't need 100% accuracy. The game is forgiving there. So even if the controls are bad, the game being forgiving, it makes up for it. In rest, the game is a beast. 
it feels like a PS2 game, it looks like a PS2 game, it has the same structure as the PS2 version, heck, it even has almost the same story and structure as the 360 version. There are some altered levels and cutscenes and lines, but it's pretty close, and the story in general is the same. Reviewers seem to complain about the graphics, because they aren't even comparable to the realistic graphics on the PS3 and 360. My question is, why will someone say that the graphics are bad if we compare the PSP to the PS3? It's like complaining about why do Java games have such bad graphics if the PC iteration looks so good. I mean, come on, it's a PSP. We have to judge it in context. And for PSP standards, the game looks good. But performance-wise, I do admit that the PSP has a little bit of frame rate stutter here and there. But the best part about the game is the story. The story is great. It manages to catch the atmosphere and joke nuances of the movie. The story alone will most probably be the best driver. I mean, sure, the controls aren't as comfy. But the story made many play the game till the end. And it's not just me saying that. But... The Metascore on Metacritic is really poor. My opinion is that the game is better than this score. I would incline to call it a hidden gem, but the poor controls kinda hinder me. Or better to say, the fact that so many people couldn't get used to the controls. Because for me the controls were fine. Sure, it's a little bit awkward to point with the face buttons. But after a while, at least in my case, I got used to them. And they felt comfy. The game is still good. And in my opinion, it's underappreciated. The game is in my opinion way better than the general consensus. I liked the little details like destructible environments, the great story that has fidelity to the source material, and the fun gameplay. The controls, as I said, were fine to me. I got used to them. But others didn't. Still, if you're a Ghostbusters fan, do yourself a service and at least try out the game. And even if you're not a fan, I will still advise you to still try it. Even if the meta score is so poor, I consider it an amazing game that deserves more appreciation. The Golden Compass is a game that received bad reviews and it makes sense why. It's not your typical game nor does the game reinvent the wheel. For the average gamer it's just boring. 7 hours of boring gameplay elements. You can roam some narrow levels or some bigger levels that only look big at first glance, but when you look at them, because they are pretty empty, they still make you feel like you have a narrow path to follow. So even if they seem big at first, they are actually pretty limitative. The combat is either a button measure or a quick time event and neither feel good. Platforming is horrible, the depth perception is poor in the game, which will make many jumps a pain. Also the checkpoint system in the game is horrible. Also along the way you play various minigames, and neither of them are particularly fun or interesting. So even there the game doesn't shine, nor does it feel good. But on the upside, the game seems to be more accurate to the book than the movie. But don't get your hopes up. The storytelling in the game is just like the movie. Bad. The game deserves its score. It does everything wrong. It has a lousy gameplay, poor controls in some parts, poor storytelling, poor graphics, poor depth perception. You have no reason to play the game. Only if you're a really, really hardcore fan or are among the 1% of people who actually like games of this sort. But for the majority, the game will be just dull and you're not missing out on anything if you don't play the game. Aragon is a really promising tie-in game. Sierra tried to custom tailor the experience on each platform. The PC and friends received a generic hack and slash the DS an action RPG, the GBA a turn-based RPG, and the PSP got a flight simulator. Yup, you play the whole game as Safira the dragon. The controls are great, there's a lot you can do when maneuvering the dragon, you can hover, turn real quick and even do 
and even do a 180 reversal. You can pick up rocks and start bombing stuff. You can snatch goats and humans to replenish your health. And the game's missions revolve around using these mechanics. You'll have to bomb stuff or kill enemies or protect stuff. The game also has multiplayer, you can share playing a level with a friend or participate in death matches, rescue the maiden or pillage and burn matches where you take turns defending the village, then the other player or team tries to burn it down faster, then you defend it again. You also get Totem of the Ancient, which is a great mode that, that hides a statue within a level and you must race to find the statue then hold on to it as you collect control points. You also get the Demented Doves, which has you searching for infected doves you can collect to infect other players. There are 9 total multiplayer ad hoc modes. And each one is fun to play, just like the single player game. Also the game is lengthy. It takes you around 8 hours to finish the story alone, and around 8 hours more to complete all the battle arenas on the map. And all this 12 hours without taking into account all the hours you can play ad hoc with friends. The mission objectives do get repetitive in those 8 hours. And in battle arenas, yeah, the game is kinda repetitive. But the game is still great. Overall, while the game won't blow you out of your pants, it's still enjoyable to play. And packs enough content to keep you hooked for hours. And because you can find it cheap nowadays, it's a great deal. Aliens vs Predator is a great game, but some reviewers seem to not be content about the game being too easy. It's too much of a casual experience, they say. But I like it. Though I do admit that the game is objectively too easy. I mean, you're basically invincible in the game. Enemy attacks barely leave a dent on your health bar. And you can even replenish your health from the menu by paying a small price in honor points. Also aside of the combat, you'll have to pinpoint bits of alien technology on the map and destroy them. But the scavenging isn't an exploration game anymore, since the map shows you the exact location of the parts. And this is not all. And this is not all what the game tells you. Whenever there's something to interact to, like a weakened wall or a crank, the game tells you with a big red triangle where you have to go and what you have to do. And honestly, I don't understand why reviewers complain about this. I mean, I mean, the PSP, even if it has decent looking textures, they still look muddy. Would those reviewers prefer to walk to each muddy texture and find out what is interactable and what not? I mean, without the red triangles, the game would have been frustrating, in my opinion. I mean, sure, because the map is so empty, there's not really much exploration involved. Even if the maps look big, they are pretty narrow in their plan. I mean, there's only so many paths you can follow. The game's plot is that an alien ship has come crashing down in a small town in Colorado and you, the predator, must destroy all traces of the newfound extraterrestrial life in the area. You encounter plenty of humans too, both civilian and from the military, which you will take out in predator fashion using the technology from the movie, such as invisibility cloaking, three types of special vision modes and the trademark laser weapons. The game also has ad hoc multiplayer, here you can play skirmish matches with a friend. You have, you have to blast as many aliens as you can in the time limit while wandering the maps from the storyline and at the end of the match the player with the most honor points wins. The levels also look very nice for a PSP and overall while I do agree that the game is very easy to beat and that might discourage hardcore seeking gamers to even try out the game, me as a casual games loving individual, I like the game. I had fun. And aside of the difficulty, the game is a great time game. It uses the source material nicely into a fun game. I consider the game an exception to the rule that time games are bad. This one is actually pretty good. Okay, so this was the video. If you liked it, please hit the like button and subscribe. If you want to financially support me in my pursuit to review as many video games as possible, you can do that on Patreon or on the channel's membership section. You will help me a lot. If you want, you can follow me on Twitch, Instagram or Discord. 
And if you want to see another video of mine, just wait till I stop talking and there will be thumbnails of other videos I've made. Thanks for watching.